Hey everybody. So today I want to give you a look, a very early look actually, at some of the things we're thinking about in terms of MEV on layer two and on optimism in particular. And I should say, you know, I say we, but a lot of these are my thoughts. Um, and so there's a big disclaimer. None of what I'm about to say is official company position. None of this is things we have put in a roadmap. Some people at Optimism disagree with me. So these are just my ideas, my mental models, how I think about this. Uh, I hope it will be helpful for you also. So um, what is MEV? All right, we need to sort of cover that so that this talk can make sense. So MEV is value that can, in theory, but not necessarily in practice, be extracted by some actor, and it's called minor extracted value because in Ethereum, um, these actors are the miners. And this actor needs to have the port order transaction. So it's also called maximal extractable value, and that covers the fact that uh, it's the value that can be extracted in theory. So I will give some example of MEV so that it becomes more concrete. Something to know is that in practice, a lot of MEV is extracted to a software used flash, uh, called Flashbots which is used by the miners. And this service lets people called MEV searchers, you can think of them as arbitragers, uh, they can bid for having their transactions or set of transactions, it's called a bundle, included in a block. And um, Flashbots gives some useful guarantees. The transactions or bundle will be atomic, so all or nothing. Uh, the bundles will not be leaked to other people. The miners can in theory do that, but there's some, sort of a social contract that they won't, otherwise they will be, they will be banned from Flashbots. Um, they pay the miner in a transaction, and th the goal of doing this is that they want to be the first one to exploit an opportunity. And bundles, the set of transactions, can contain transactions from the searcher, but also from other people that they got from public mempool. So what are some examples of MEV? So there's arbitrage, simply buy something at a low price, sell it at a high price. There's backrunning, which is um, capture an MEV opportunity right after the transaction that creates it. So some of them are arbitrage that you do after uh, price oracle updates. And uh, another example is on lending markets, liquidations uh, are also like that. They also come after a price oracle update. So there are races who gets to mint the newest, hottest NFT. There's front running. If anybody makes a transaction that is gonna make them money, some people on Ethereum are gonna look at that transaction and see, can I, make, can I do the same thing? And if they can, they're gonna front run you and do it before you. There's sandwiching, which is, if you see someone's gonna buy some token, say ETH, you buy ETH before them, and then you sell ETH right after them, after they increase the price. And what that does is as the, the, the victim, the, the person that is in the middle of the sandwich is going to have a very bad slippage on their trade. They're actually gonna get the maximum slippage. So there's really a victim in this case, whereas arbitrage doesn't really have a victim. Uh, there's just in time liquidity. And I, I think I'm gonna skip that because I think for time it might be better, but if I have time, I'll come back to this one. So MEV is a massive scale. So this is from the dashboard from Flashbots. They account for 600 million total extracted MEV and 8.5 million over the uh, last three days and 76,000 over the, you know, a few days ago. And uh, this is highly asymmetric, right? Some days it really spikes like crazy, like the biggest arbitrage of all time was 5 million. Well, at least what we, what we know about. And that was an arbitrum, so on layer two. So there's already big uh, MEV on layer two today. So does it mean if you good or bad? That's a bad framing, right? It depends. Arbitrage needs to be done. You know, if, if the price is indifferent, liquidity pool is different, somebody's gonna make that money. And my take is that this might as well be the network, right? The miners on L1 or the protocol on L2. Um, similarly, NFT drop, somebody will get the NFT. So you can't really get rid of that. There are some things you can get rid of. The sandwiches, are almost pretty zero sum. I should add that in theory it's possible to construct exotic scenarios where that is not the case, but I'm not sure they're relevant in practice. And uh, yeah, generally nobody likes to be front run. You know, if you saw a shiny opportunity, you try to get it. 
somebody just copies you, doesn't do the work, that doesn't feel very good. So um, some people want to get rid of MEV uh, altogether. You can't really do that, right? Like, like I said, arbitrage will be done by someone, and there's no reason that you should give that money to some arbitrager. You should help uh, you know, get it back into the ecosystem, grow the ecosystem, and up the value proposition of optimism there is to fund something called public goods, which are things that benefit everybody, but that nobody is really incentivized to fund. Some people are trying to do something they call fair ordering, and that's just basically trying to get the transactions in the order in which they arrive. This is not super fair, actually, because it privileges people that have really low latency to the miner or to the sequencer on layer two. And so this has people that buy like fancy antenna, fancy cables, fancy servers. Uh, we, we have seen that happen a lot in the traditional stock market, for instance. And then if you don't uh, actually uh, allow some, some kind of auction mechanism, then you get some really negative externalities, which are uh, mostly spam. So now we get to the interesting part, MEV on layer two. I will very quickly explain layer two, and this is, I explain one form of layer two, which is an optimistic rollup in just one slide. You have your um, big network of computers on the top. This is Ethereum. You can transact there directly on L1 or you can transact on L2, and if you transact on L2, you send that transaction to something called a sequencer. This sequencer will uh, execute the transaction. It will send the data of the transaction to Ethereum, but Ethereum will not execute it. Then there are other actors called verifiers. They download the transaction, and they re-execute it, and they verify that the result is the same as the sequencer. If the result is the same, there's no problem. Uh, if the result is different, they can do a process called a fault proof to challenge the result from the sequencer. So the big difference is that we have this big entity called the sequencer, and in practice, we want to decentralize that so there's multiple sequencers, um, whereas the Ethereum network is much more decentralized, and we rely on verifiers for security. So what's the goal on, uh, uh, you know, for MEV on layer two? Capture most of the value for the protocol for funding public goods make the user experience good for users. If I'm a user, I don't want to have to think about whether uh, I'm gonna be sandwiched, uh, whether there's gonna be some just-in-time liquidity, which is this other form of MEV. Um, I, I don't wanna think about that. It's really bad user experience to have these concerns. And the third concern is that uh, we want to decentralize effectively, so have multiple sequencers. Any solution we come with for MEV needs to be compatible with that goal. So to maximize profit, there's two um, principles. Intermediation, the more intermediary you have, the less profit you can make for the protocol. And the principle of certainty, the more uncertain you are about which opportunities are available, the less profit you can make. And that is because if you are bidding for inclusion in the next block, you know about all the opportunities. If you're bidding for inclusion in 10 blocks, you can sort of guess what kind of opportunities will be available, but you're not sure. So you're going to get to, to bid a lot less because of you don't know how much money you can make. So one big question is, uh, well, we want to extract MEV, but also we know some kinds of MEV are bad for users. Can we just ban the, the kinds of MEV that are bad for users? That would be ideal. Uh, and so we, you kind of need to draw a line and say, this is okay, this is not okay. Uh, so first of all, you know, that it's a question of what do we decide? And then there's another question, once we have decided what is good and what is bad, how do we actually uh, enforce these rules? There's two ways to enforce these rules, which are by technical constraints, so actually uh, software systems that will make sure that everything is okay, or arbitration, whereas some party will check that the rules are respected and will inflict some kind of penalty on the actors that uh, breach this. So it could, it could be banned, so they could not be a sequencer anymore, or they could have a deposit that gets uh, slashed, so you know, destroyed if they uh, misbehave. So what I'm proposing is to ban front running, because nobody likes front running. It doesn't really do anything good. And it also, it also avoids sandwiching, which is some of the most adversarial thing that happens. It also sidesteps some legal concerns. I mean, some jurisdiction, it's possible that front running could be considered illegal. So if you enable that, it could come back on you. And this is a policy that would have worked 
uh, yeah, this is a typo, it's worked, not forked, for all of MEV's short history. It's narrative compatible, so you can sell people on the idea, yeah, we're gonna have MEV, which is fine, it's gonna happen anyway, but we're gonna ban front running because that's something that nobody really likes. So, yeah, so I have a um, quick technical question. Like I see the timer is at zero. Is, am I supposed to take questions or can I continue? Because I can assume my presentation was 20 minutes. I'll keep going and somebody will stop me if that's bad. Um, so there's two technical solutions uh, to ban front running. The first one is to remove the transaction, uh, well, there's no, sorry, two steps. Remove the transaction ordering capabilities, so prevent the miner, prevent the sequencer from deciding the order of the transactions. And then later, step two, reintroduce some possibility for ordering some transactions. So to remove the ordering capabilities, we can either have some kind of oracle that tells you which transaction came in first, so FIFO is first in, first out, or we can have a solution called threshold encryption, which lets you decide on the ordering of some encrypted transactions, such that you don't know what you're ordering, and then later the transactions are decrypted and you will know what you're ordering. So in both cases, you need a second network that will provide an ordering, and uh, the security of this network will ensure that uh, the ordering is, is um, nobody's manipulating the ordering, basically. So once you've done that, you reintroduce the ordering, and the sequencer, what it can do is do an auction for transaction that will be included at the top of the block. It must do so before knowing of the other transactions, because otherwise it could move the other transaction to the top of the block, which would be bad. Um, and so there's other um, transactions that could opt in into a public pool, and these are typically things that can be backrun. So Oracle price updates would be in a public pool, so everybody could see them, and everybody could say, I want to be the first transaction after the Oracle price update. Okay, so this is a, a, a slightly longer explanation of the two technical solutions, which I'm going to skip. You could also do something else, which is arbitration. So somebody would decide that the rules have been uh, violated, and probably this would be some kind of governance, either via token or via another structure. There's a big problem with this, because in this solution, all the transactions are public, so they can be seen. So uh, all, everybody that can see the transactions, and this would be all the sequencers, they can front run. And we can't really say who front run. Flashbots has the same problem, and it's some kind of, of social contract that you shouldn't do this, and this has worked well in practice, but it's a pretty weak guarantee, right? Like anybody could do this, and then everybody would be, oh, who did this? Um, and if they're very skilled, we, you couldn't know that they were the one front running. So this is a good, I would say, short-term solution. It's probably not the solution we want for 100 years or even 20 years uh, in the future. Okay, so this is sort of the, the rundown. Like, the single solution is straight secure, very proof. It can handle uh, a very large sequencer set because there's no problem of saying which it or not. It's complex. You introduce latency in the system so it can make things a little bit slower to, to get your transaction uh, included. Arbitration is way easier, we know it can work, but there's this nasty issue of people are cheating, or could be cheating. So uh, one, one thing Optimism has been pushing in the past is called MEVA, MEV auctions, and the idea is to auction the right to build blocks, and so the person who built the blocks, they capture 100% of the uh, MEV minus whatever they pay to searchers. Uh, this is simple to implement, but brings less profit to the protocol because of the principle of certainty and intermediation. You have one more intermediary, uh, and then you, you're also not certain because you're, you're auctioning many blocks at the same time. Uh, but this has another advantage, is that it can be used to decide which sequencer will, will build a block, because it's just an auction. Whoever wins the auction can build the blocks. Uh, you still have the problem that um, if you have a public mempool, um, everybody that can see the mempool could uh, front run. But this is a, po a possible short-term ar alternative to arbitration because it's also pretty simple to deploy um, in contrast with technical solutions. All right, this was a lot, so if you have any questions, I'll be hanging around, and uh, thank you very much for your attention.